our first session showing adaptability and innovation. Uh, uh, Bianca Bates, Chief Client Officer and Deputy CEO at Cuskill. It's going to be about the open data revolution, an unstoppable force that could transform your business, building on the open regulated data agenda to create powerful data-driven customer relationships. Uh, the session will share global insights and case studies that will be useful. Um, we'll hear from Jamie Leach as well, the domain lead regulated data services at Cuskill and a data champion and fintech fanatic with a passion for consumer for the consumer data right, the founder of Open Data Australia and has been advocating for open banking for years. So we'll hear Bianca, then Jamie, then Bianca and Jamie uh, with a Q&A that I'll facilitate. So first, welcome Bianca. Thanks very much, James, and good morning, everyone. I hope uh, for those of you that could join us for dinner last night that you had a really great time. It was so good to catch up with um, many of you in person. So as James uh, has just explained, we've had a little reshuffle, and hopefully this is a great session to start. One of our new products uh, is Open Data, and our Open Data product development journey started in around 2018. 2017-18, when open banking re regulation uh, came into force in the UK. Uh, pretty slowly, I must say, uh, and it's, it's not been a real rapid evolution journey since. But it, back in 2018, we thought, we always thought that data, payments, uh, and real time were really critical to bring forward a really amazing customer experience and we thought this open banking uh, regulation could enable that. So we scanned the globe to think about where is a place we could go to get as many rich learnings as possible about what's possible with open banking. And I know you're all probably thinking, where is she going to say that they went? Um, and you may be surprised or not surprised, but we landed ourselves in India. Uh, and we found India as a result of speaking to uh, thought leaders globally around where we might go and see something with open banking or open data uh, in a real life ecosystem. What we found in India was that data had become open, both regulated data, and when I talk about regulated data, I'm talking about the kind of data that has privacy implications. So banking data or utility data, data that's really specific and personal to people. So the regulated data had become open in a collaborative exchange that was actually consolidated uh, through one organization. So they opened up all the data via APIs and it was available to not only banks, but any organization who wanted to use that data. As well as that, all of the non-regulated data, so think train timetables, movie uh, ticket purchases, anything that's available for consumption, uh, all of that data was available as well. So what quickly happened was that technology companies jumped on that data thinking, wow, think about all the customer experiences that I can deliver. And we found an organization, and it's not just the only one, there's many of them, but Paytm, uh, Brett mentioned it yesterday. It was effectively a super app that people could live their lives through. There was absolutely no need to do anything but use Paytm. You wake up in the morning, want to check the weather. You want to see if your train's on time. You want to buy your weekly train ticket. You want to book something for the weekend. Uh, you want to move some money. You want to make a payment. Everything could be done. It was absolute life simplification through this app. It was astonishing, and it was all made available, all sort of all made happen by open data. So uh, that was kind of very interesting, exciting. We then went to the State Bank of India, uh, which is the largest bank in India, and they were actually doing the same thing. They did spend a little bit of time, as major banks do, thinking, we'll just ignore this and it will go away and people won't get excited about it. But sure enough, they found themselves with their customers not coming into their um, mobile banking app and actually losing interest in the engagement with the bank. So the State Bank of India effectively built their own super app. 
So they had an app where people could shop, people could bank, people could live their lives through their app. So what, what was the big takeout for that was that open banking might start as something that is a regulatory journey, that it's a compliance journey, but if consumers start seeing how they can get some real value from it, they will push for more. Uh, we've already seen customer experience expectations grow exponentially, particularly as we've moved uh, into a more digital environment. But what we saw in India really sparked some excitement in us to come back and think about what we could do in Australia. So, uh, unfortunately, there was the long, boring compliance journey that we knew we needed to get ready for. Uh, so, with the consumer data rights, starting with banking as the first industry to go live, uh, we knew that many of our clients would need to be compliant with open banking. So, uh, rather than be short-sighted and think, let's just focus on what's first, we designed what we thought uh, would first of all let our clients comply with CDR legislation, but ultimately allow our clients to compete in the same way that we'd seen come to life in the ecosystem in India. I should say, one of the key elements, and we did talk about this a little bit yesterday as well, one of the things that made the experience so seamless was digital ID. Uh, I think many organizations who have delivered a very seamless experience, it does start off a little clunky with having to take photos of licenses and proving that you're a live person holding that license. Uh, the digital ID system was also really critical to this. So we came back to Australia and thought, let's see about building a collaborative data exchange that provides really strong consent, allows our clients to comply with CDR legislation, and also allows them to compete in delivering these experiences. So uh, we spent, as many of you I know in the room who are financial services, a lot of pain and suffering in 2021 uh, going live with CDR compliance. Uh, and we proudly went live with our clients last year for the compliance solution. We're now turning our mind to not only compliance for beyond banking, but also how to enable the compete side of things. And Jamie's gonna to talk to you a little bit about that more. As we look at compete, we think, what are the use cases? And I, and I can't tell you how many times I've been asked that question. What is the use case, Bianca? What, what can we do first? It's a little bit daunting to think, how do we go from where we are to what we saw in India? So, um, Thankfully, uh, both Jamie and I were asked to go to Marbella earlier in the year in Spain uh, to present at the Global Open Banking um, Forum. The reason they wanted both Jamie and I there was globally, Australia is seen as quite a progressive um, country in the way that we've regulated open banking, open data, CDR. And that's because we've started with the consumer at the center of it. This is the cons Australian consumer's data, uh, and we're looking at how to protect that, but also open it up so that it can deliver amazing experiences. And we are one of the only country, well, I think we are actually the only country that has looked at it that way, and also put the belts and braces around consent in place uh, in a very consistent way. And those consents at Cusco, we're looking to also streamline with our MPP product. So uh, I was asked to present on a consent panel and Jamie was asked to present on other panels. And uh, I, I was actually going to think, I'm gonna come back with the killer use case. In fact, no, they were looking at us, what is your killer use case? Um, but unfortunately, I didn't come back with that, but I did come back with some really clear certainty from the European countries that have already rolled out open banking. And that is the things to focus on that are actually getting really big benefits are, one, this might sound boring, but it, it, it's very helpful uh, for your people and your customers, is back office efficiency. So think about all the processes within your organization that could be automated, places where you need to enter, key in, uh, or ask your customers data that you've already got within your own organization. So those operational efficiencies are proving out to be quite significant cost saves within organizations. The second one, and we did talk about this yesterday, is the end of form filling in, which is the bane of customers' existence. And I think 
Brett did mention yesterday, as well as some of our other presenters, if your customers have to engage with you by signing a piece of paper or coming in with a big chunky um, pile of documents, it's not going to work for very much longer. So the other very simple use case is thinking about how you can stop uh, your customers from having to fill in paperwork or even digital forms. So this is what we're working on now, and Jamie's going to speak to you uh, a little bit about that um, in more detail. In fact, Jamie's going to share with you what we're seeing globally uh, with open banking, having me provide, provided that um, brief overview, and then talk about what we're working on at Cuskill, and hopefully that will be the start of a discussion that many of you can continue with us. So with that, um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Jamie Lee, Leach, who joined Cuskill a few months ago uh, as our domain lead for regulated data and is really taking the lead uh, at progressing our collaborative open data exchange to the next level. Welcome, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just start by saying I've been involved with open banking and the consumer data right in, in Australia and internationally for, for more than four years. In fact, Scott Farrell, um, who I've, I've got a quote, I personally blame for the consumer data right. Um, we presented at the ACCC conference at the start of 2019. So I get down there all nervous thinking, his government, all these top economists, what am I possibly going to teach them? I get up on stage with Scott and a representative of the ABA and the opening line, we're talking about APIs and there's just blank stares around the room. And then somebody puts up their hand and says, what's an API? It was the downfall of the whole panel. We've tried to equate APIs as like train tracks and there's stations at either end and everyone's trying to help everybody out. But it became obvious at that point that Open banking really wasn't something that was on the radar of most people, and people that I thought should have definitely been across it. So uh, open banking has been a passion of mine for a long time. But before open banking, open data was, was my jam. And I have, to, I have to just set the record straight. Open banking is not open data. We talk about the open data economy. But I'm a purist, and open data, as Bianca pointed out, is really the start of governments being asked to be transparent and sharing public data back with the public. It actually started in 2006 when the Guardian newspaper in the UK ran a campaign about governments being transparent and open and publishing Crown data. So a bit of noise, not much happened. But then in 2007, a group of 30 of the top leading industrialists and, and data and technology people met in Sebastopol, California. And they met behind closed doors for three days and actually created the basis for open data. So much like Katrina was saying yesterday with AI, there were principles of agreement amongst these 30 people, which I'm led to believe were 30 men. Now, I'm not going to say anything, but Diversity wasn't really there in 2007. So they came up with the concepts of if you're going to publish data, it should be complete. So the whole data set. Don't just give me an extract, give me the data set. It must be primary, meaning you haven't manipulated it. It's as close to the source of where that data is being collected. It's got to be accessible, which means we don't start to bring in special platforms or things that, that may preclude certain people from being able to access it. It has to be machine processable or readable, because even they realised that technology and digital were going to be at the forefront of all data uses. It has to be non-discriminatory. So we talked about biases yesterday. Data shouldn't be discriminatory. It's, it's just evidence. Uh, it has to be non-proprietary. So once again, open data is often published in Excel spreadsheets. What if you don't have access to Excel or Microsoft software? It's not actually open data. And it has to be license free. Now, it will be published with a CCCA, meaning you know, you're giving you know, claim to whoever published it, but it's, it's meant to be license free. 
They then said there's seven other principles. Online, digital, where else are you going to publish open data? Not in a gazette. Um, it's got to be permanent. Once it's up, it's always up. Trusted, a presumption of openness, documented, safe to open. So none of these little phishing, well, phishing scams didn't exist in 2007. And that has to be designed with public input for public interest. Fast forward to 2009, Barack Obama passed a bill that if data can be published openly, it has to be. 2010, the UK government then brought in an act or a license saying that Crown copyrighted data should be published if it can be. Australia joins roughly 2010, Prime Minister and Cabinet before Data 61 took it over in 2015. And then in 2019, my favourite, Trump then reintroduced the same bill that already existed that Obama had brought in, saying if it can be open, it has to be. So that's a bit of the, the background for open data. I just had to clear that up. So open banking, when did that actually become a movement? It's become such a point in our lives. Where it just rolls off the tip of the tongue. We all blame the British. The UK started open banking. They, they didn't actually. Pre-Brexit, it was the European Union that brought in payments reform, regulatory reform with PSD2. So the UK was part of Europe back then. So it really started there. And, and when they brought that in, it wasn't open banking as we see it. It was three ele elements. It was the ability to move money through payments, the sharing of account information, and the confirming of account balances. Now, if you think about it, that pretty much coins everything you could want to do with banking. Customer information, their transactions, and how much money they have. So it was a starting point, but it is not equal to the system that we're bringing in here. So once again, the man I blame for everything, who will be presenting later, and I will tell him, I tell him that regularly, it's all good. Actually, once he published the review and the report in 2018, came out with this quote, and I love it. Consumers can now share the data that they have with the businesses that they select for the uses they choose. So we're talking about use cases. If they see value in that use case, they will consent for their data to be shared. It's consumer's choice. First stage of the CDR, open banking is already helping Australians, but the journey has just begun. And that's because Scott was a visionary that realised that he was only going to get one bite of regulatory reform cherry in this country. And I once said to him, what, banking wasn't enough? Why did you have to bring up all these other sectors? And he said, I was only going to get one ch chance to pass it through government. So he said, I swung for the rafters, and we've written it in a way that we can then decide what other sectors are designated and brought in as it is deemed appropriate. So just like those visionaries sitting around that table in Sebastopol, there are some elements to what we see as best practice when it comes to open banking or any sort of sectoral inclusion for open data. Consumer consent, first and foremost, we are talking informed, express consent. No longer is it bundled, implied consent. That's the biggest change that we're seeing. The days of filling out a form with a bank and the fine prints in size font, you know, font four down the bottom that says, you agree to share your data with whoever the bank deems appropriate for whatever purpose may you know, improve the service offering, those days are gone. And it's actually a really good thing, both for the bank and the customer. So at the centre is the consumer data right. This is a digital power of attorney moving with the digital world. It's no longer filling out forms. Implementation, necessary evil. How you actually go about creating it, how you go about the accreditation, how you go about deciding what is that level playing field. Liability model. It's a fact of life. If something goes wrong, we have to blame somebody. And in the UK, restitution actually has to be made by the bank if funds go wayward or if there is some sort of monetary loss. Now, we haven't gone that far in Australia, but the liability model actually takes up, there's the man that I like to blame, it takes up a huge portion of the original review. If you read it, which I have sadly many times, there is actually a table of suggested liability model, but 
when you have one of the country's top lawyers writing the review, it's hardly surprising that liability got such a, a big chunk of the review. Regulatory framework. It is a fact. We live in one of the most highly regulated countries in the world, and financial services definitely sits at the top of that. So the regulatory framework, the reform, was always going to be really granular. Technology. This is a digital game. Technology is, is at the core of every decision you will make, closely followed by what are those processes internally that you are going to reform. And lastly, governance and funding. The simple fact is, there have to be rules to the game. There has to be a ref, and somebody has to pay for the tickets. So these are the, the best practice principles, or the seven characteristics of open banking. Now, around the world, we talk about the UK, we talk about Australia. You've probably all heard Brazil is absolutely blowing up at the moment from open finance. They're not just going with banking, they're going finance. But this is a movement that is sweeping right across the world. And even as I look at this today, this slide is now out of date for a reason. No two countries in the world have adopted the same framework. Mind-blowing. If we think about international trade and just how global citizens are these days, to have no two countries that are approaching this the same is just crazy. You can see the, the dark blue. This is a mandatory, compulsory obligation of compliance. Australia's there, Brazil is there, elements of Europe are there. The brown, tan, ochre, whatever colour you want to call it, Regulations are implemented, but it's voluntary. So they've set the rules of the game and said, if you want to play, these are the rules you must abide by. Then you have the orange. There is regulatory guidelines that have been published. Think Indonesia with their API playbook that they've recently launched and the sandboxes throughout Southeast Asia. So they've said, these are the games. We're, we're publishing it. Um, now, North America grey. North America, informal, industry-led. It will be one of the last countries in the world to get a regulated open banking because we know that America is one of the most fragmented countries in the world. Every state will do something different. And even when you bring in CCPA privacy guidelines for California, it's not national. So the US will be the interesting one that we'll see. Um, and lastly, there's no statistics for a lot of South America, Africa, uh, a lot of other countries that are going through developmental cycles still. But there are four motivations behind why countries are employing open banking. And they are regulatory reform, think Australia. How many reviews, commissions, royal commissions, inquiries did we have from 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18? And then 2020, I think we missed one in 2019, Scott, didn't we? So we, we love a good regulatory reform here. Then you have industry-led. So this is where we start to see businesses say, we can do better. We'll have common APIs. We'll start to bring in some rules. New Zealand was almost there. They were almost across the finish line being industry-led. And then they announced they're going to go down a CDR route. It was so tantalizingly close. Um, the two that I find fascinating, though, and this is what we're seeing across parts of Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, eradication of poverty, so banking the unbanked. Largely cash societies, people that for whatever reason may not have been eligible for bank accounts, cannot travel, are now having access to banking for the first time. And the last one, to combat financial crime. If you can put the money in a bank account and you can track the data, then you can track where the dollars are actually going. So the UK, we can't ignore. The stats come out every month, but I just want to caveat, these stats are incredibly deceptive. In the UK, they mandated nine businesses, the CMA9, the biggest banks throughout the UK and Northern Ireland. And they are still the only nine that the data is collected each month by the OBIE and published. What you're not seeing is every other banking institution in the UK. 
But even with that considered, they are growing so quickly. Um, we've got 339 regulated providers, 249 third-party providers. So these are the, the data recipients, if you like, that provide end-to-end -end solutions. 90 account providers. Um, this report recently came out, they publish it regularly, the Open Banking Implementation Entity in the UK. Uh, more than a million successful open banking API calls have been made now. Now, if you think it took three years to get 3% adoption, it doesn't really sound that exciting. But they've changed the rules of the game several times with cybersecurity standards, with API standards. They've had a couple of false starts. In May, they had a 500% increase in payments from the month before. We're starting to see things rolling through. Month on month growth overall of API calls of 10%. 128 fully regulated firms with life to market solutions. 142 agents of regulated third party providers or data recipients as we'd call them here. 10 to 11% of digitally enabled consumers are active users of at least one open banking service. So we're not just seeing people using it with their own bank, they're starting to use it throughout their daily lives for multiple purposes. 64% use data enabled open banking services with 30% of use of open banking payments. Open banking enable cloud accounting services. Now I want to make a point, difference between Australia and the UK. There's a lot of differences, but the biggest one is who can access the data. So the way the Australian rules were written is you have to be inside the bubble. You've got to be accredited to access the data. Now they've brought in tiered accreditation to lower the barriers to entry, but there is still a massive sticking point and this sticking point affects SMEs and it affects them through the cloud accounting software. So as many of you know, we've got brands such as Xero, MYOB, Intuit, Sage in this country. 2.4 million SMEs utilize these services daily. Data feeds come in, they access up to 1,500 third-party apps in a marketplace, helping them with their invoicing, expense claims, taxation, whatever. Those 1,500 apps, some of them are small players, mum and dad shops, they're not talking million dollar businesses, need to become accredited, and that accreditation can cost anywhere north of $100,000 to get access to the data. So literally overnight, when those cloud accounting software providers go live, all of these businesses lose access to 1,500 services that they rely on on a daily basis. So that's 2.4 million SMEs. If we can solve that issue in this country, that's 8% instantly. We almost triple the adoption of the UK just by making one change. Those marketplace apps are able to get hold of tax data through legislation. The legislation doesn't align between the ATO and the consumer data right. That's my soapbox moment for a second. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, but then we move on. So Europe, we'd think Europe's all created equally. They brought in PSD2 reform. No, there is a league table that's actually published now on Europe. And the top providers, UK, no, no doubt there. Then you have Germany has gone into second place. They were third last year. Ireland was second, they're now down to eighth, and Sweden has leapfrogged a whole heap of people to come in on the podium at third. But there's re reasons, it's the strength of the regulatory reform, it's the quality of the APIs, and above all else, it's their payments movement of money and the robustness of their systems. Every single country is doing it differently. And that was one of the biggest things for Bianca and I when we were in Marbella. I just want to rub it in. We were in Spain at a resort on the beach. It was hard work. You may have seen one of those photos of me and a number of women sitting on the grass. It was networking. It was t we were talking business, I swear. But keep in mind that we went over there thinking we are going to learn from these powerhouses that have been doing open banking longer than us. Everybody wanted to know what was happening in Australia. So we are actually more advanced than we probably give ourselves credit for. 
Brazil, giant, behemoth. They've got more than 150 banks that are going live as we speak. They have 1,446 at the time this data was collected, fintechs, which account for more than a third of the entire continent in Brazil that are all going live with open finance. Keep in mind when I say finance, they're including superannuation, non-bank lending, BNPL, crypto, all of that in this one vein. It's gonna come on in a tiered fashion phase, but they are looking at this as finance all encompassing. They have a pro-innovation regulatory landscape. They are actively investing, trying to help these fintechs. And we heard about new banks valuation yesterday. There is some serious money being moved. What we're also seeing is huge portions of the unbanked now being banked for the first time. Brazil, as with a lot of South American companies, has been largely cash-based economy for many reasons. We're seeing people get bank accounts for the first time, digital ones, but it still counts. And it means they now have a record. They can get credit. They can access services that they never could before. Financial inclusion will be driven by a combination of innovation and government intervention. That's at the core of why Brazil is doing what they're doing. New Zealand. I've been working with the API Centre and the API Council and, and MB and DIA, so the, the Ministry of Business and the Department of Internal Affairs on open banking for probably the last three years. And the API Council, API Centre were that far away from finishing what was going to be an industry accepted liability model. And that's where it fell over. So, you know, I have been consulting off the record to the government on how they cannot repeat the same mistakes that Australia has made. How can they do it quicker? How can they do it on a fraction of the budget that Australia has done it? And the answers are actually quite simple. Whether they'll listen to them or not, and the number one thing I brought up was that accounting issue. The UK, Brazil, the moment that data is sitting with a data recipient, game over, because they have the GDPR, or Brazil's got the version, the, the Latin version, the LDPR. We have an absence of a robust privacy framework. We're in the middle of a five-year privacy review in this country, which means we have become so prescriptive in who can play and how they can play and, and what they have to do, which hoops they have to jump through. Some would say it is, it's necessary and unnecessary at the same time, depending on which side of the table you sit on. But these are some of the examples. So I've been looking at the UK for years, and I love a good use case. You want it to be tangible. You want to understand why is it commercially viable for a business to develop it, but more importantly, how does it enhance that customer experience? These are three of my favourites. So Bud. Bud has morphed. Has anybody heard of Bud? They're actually being invested in by some of the Australian banks now, and they're, I think they're accredited now. Um, Bud started off as a marketplace. It started off as a, a sandbox where you could literally have all of your different bank accounts, Barclays, Deutsche, whoever, on a single screen. And then it morphed to you could move money between these different accounts instantly in real time. But what they struggled with was how to commercialise it. So then they worked out they could get a clip for moving that money. Then they started to look at additional services and it turned into more of a, a personal finance management, a P PFM. It's continuing to morph, but Bud's been around as, as one of the starters. Nine spokes. This is where we start to see different people's life, you know, bookkeeper in a box, open businesses that are relying on real-time data to make decisions. You know, I've seen shop fronts have point of sale data, staffing data, um, inventory data, all of that in real time on an iPad as they're walking around the shop. Small businesses being able to access short term finance with an AI algorithm that's predicting when that shortfall may come and then recommending based on your transaction and credit record the best solution for you. And by the way, if you want it, click this button and the money's in your bank account the next day. These are the sorts of things we're seeing coming out of Europe and the UK. 
but sadly, it's tiny little pockets because largely they haven't worked out how to commercialise these things on a large scale. But you've got to keep in mind, regulatory landscape is different. If we want to start saying we've looked at your credit record and we recommend these products, that borderlines on giving advice. And these are the sort of sticking areas that we need to think about. You can go so far, but if it's a recommendation, what does that mean for your organisation? But this is where open banking and open data starts to merge. So we're starting with banking. We know payments is coming one day. Payment initiation, action initiation, this is where we talk about read and write access, the rest of the world calls it. But the thing we've got up our sleeve is we've got pay two, NPP. If you look at it, you know, pound for pound, it actually allows you to do pretty much everything that payments and PSD2 does in the UK and Europe, and you can do it now. Then we start to move into open finance. That's the big exciting one. That's where we start to look at general insurance, asset management, wealth management, superannuation, BNPL, crypto, the list goes on. And that's going to be a massive behemoth. That's already in the designation process. It hasn't been finalised, and they'll start with non-bank lending, which is quite a large and a growing market in this, this country. But then we get into the other sectors. Energy goes live in November. Telco will be 12 months later, as will the rest of the energy companies. Big three have been designated, AGL, Energy Australia and Origin. November next year, any energy retailer with 10,000 clients or more has to go live. Telco, probably the big three, will be announced initially. But it's all based on use cases. How many different ways can you use energy data? Well, let's be honest, most people are going to come up with a comparison site. But if you start to look at network data, what does that do for corporates, town planning? You know, there's a number of different use cases that you can conceive. But other sectors that have been slated, health. Personally, I can't see health ever getting up in this country. We have so many issues about privacy. But in other regions, the sharing of health data with full consent actually means you can get better treatment and better options. Retail, transit, transport, smart city data. But who can see that little yellow circle sitting outside that box? Public data. And for all those people that said the government will never actually share, public data in the consumer data right, it's on the menu. So this is what the government has said they're going to do over the next 18 months to two years when it was first put up. We start to see the timeline for banking being finished. There was a, a statutory review that was always slated in the legislation that's about to have you know, the, the recommendations handed down. Start to see energy, telco, open finance, and down the bottom, consultation on government data. Now, I'm going to tell you there's a massive issue with that. The data sharing and release of the DAT bill that was introduced last year is 100% incompatible with the consumer data right. I can't wait to see government data, and I'll, I'll explain why I come into this. It's going to take longer than I think Treasury realises. This is pretty much the landscape of what we're seeing in Australia, and you can look up and go, doesn't look very impressive. You've got to remember, the rules are still being written. Joint accounts go live end of September. Complex and business accounts, first of November. We haven't even really started, and we're already seeing people go early. Frollo, for instance. Frollo was the first accredited. Now, let me tell you a little secret, though. Frollo was part of the original testing group. So one could say, did they have a competitive advantage? Possibly. But then we start to look at the scenarios of what could happen with the CDR. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'd like to think that it's going to be somewhere between these four. But there's four potential scenarios. First one, the walled garden. This is literally where we see super participants start to rise up, the rise of the super apps, the rise of the big platforms. 
and we end up with a short little supply, a handful of businesses that have worked out how to commercialise this, and they literally protect open banking for themselves. There'll be a low churn because they'll get really good at meeting the customer's needs. Small number of providers. Why would anybody ever want to leave? They can do everything they want to do. You think of some of those examples out of Asia and different places where they've literally become, and, and even the one from India that Bianca men mentioned, they are their lives, so why do you need to look anywhere else? Winners are going to be those larger organisations that leverage key partnerships. You can create a platform, you don't need to build everything yourself, but you have got to make sure that your alliances meet your needs and the needs of your customers. The losers, those that didn't prioritise open data, those that sat back and said, oh, we'll just wait and see if this ever comes to fruition. If you miss the boat on a walled garden scenario, you're going to be shut out. So the key enablers, high infrastructure ready, reliability and readiness. So these are the bigger organisations. You're going to have high data quality. Data quality is still one of the biggest slated issues for open banking in Australia, and it's contentious, because depending on who you talk to, some people say it's an issue, some say it's not so bad. What I do know right now of those accredited entities, they are marking their own homework. They are literally reporting in to the ACCC, although that is starting to change and it needs to change, because if we're going to rely on digital and data solutions, you've got to be able to rely on the quality of that data. Um, for this walled garden to, to really come about, we do need read and write access. So we need the whole kit and caboodle all in there. That's how super apps and platforms really run. And lastly, you know, these organisations will be particularly well placed to leverage probably not just banking data, but every aspect of a consumer's life. So the next one, the good old CDR supermarket. This is almost the opposite. We start to see many little options that are very specific stand up and consumers start to say, I don't need to pick one, I can pick many. I'll start to find different, different providers for different aspects of my life. I don't have to be loyal, I can just move between them, which poses a problem if you're actually a, a bank or an organisation providing those solutions, because how do you fight for that optimal shelf positioning? How do you keep your consumers loyal to you? It's an interesting question. So the winners could be both small or large providers. You'll leverage partnerships build out scale in their use cases, lean in early, and build out capability. The losers are those that fail to adapt their use cases to what the market actually demands. So you come up with one use case and you, you lean in and say, this is us. You might find yourself on the bottom shelf of the grocery store where you become less attractive as other brighter items start to filter through. But once again, for this scenario, we need high infrastructure reliability, high data quality, or else you're not going to get multiple use cases. We need read and write capabilities, but we need to realise what the commercial benefits to the providers actually will be, and what's the enhanced customer experience for the customers. So still probably not a scenario that if you're a provider you want, where you have to constantly brighten what your offering is and adapt, but it's a possibility. The CDR lead balloon. I couldn't actually find a picture of a lead balloon, but I thought this sort of uh, really set the scene. This is not a scenario we want. This one literally talks about all the hype has been for nothing. You lean in, you build a solution, and you know what? <laughs> Nobody actually wants to use it. Participants, you know, have readied themselves with ADR, accreditation, preparation and the chance of positive outcomes. The government fails to finish the rules. They're slow. The regulation doesn't evolve. Data quality doesn't improve. And we're all just feeling like the air has been let out. Personally, I don't think that's the scenario we're going to see ourselves in. But there is a risk if we don't finish off elements. So that's something, you know, the regulatory rollout's continued, it's been stifled with significant delays, priorities keep flicking between telco and energy, and maybe they'll do action initiation and payments, maybe they won't. You get the picture. 
And the last one, the slow CDR take up, the slow burn. You build it and they come very slowly to use it. Trust hasn't been established. Maybe quality's not there. There's still other forms of getting data, direct data feeds, direct APIs, the dreaded screen scraping, you know, is, continues. And consumers say, I just don't see the value. Why do I want to give consent? You know, I hate filling out forms, but I don't really want to change. So the one area that will immediately start to change that is if public education and awareness was provided. The Treasury Department in the UK, the Open Banking Implementation Energy to the, uh, entity, to this day still declares their greatest regret. So we're years on. Their greatest regret is they did zero public education and awareness. The Treasury Department, the ACCC, have been funded at least twice on a public education and awareness campaign that is still yet to be rolled out. If you want the general public that may or may not trust their, their financial services providers, hopefully everyone in this room has got a loyal customer base, but you're bringing in something new. It's like saying to my father, you're going to live in a cryptocurrency world. This is a man who still doesn't use an ATM because he prefers to go into the bank and look at the, I think he likes to go in and look at the bank tellers, honestly, but he tells me it's because he still wants that personal connection. You know, we have elements in this country, pockets that still don't have access to digital services. We still have pockets in this country that are digitally illiterate and may not have reliable internet connection. So there's, there's elements that could mean it's slow. 80% of this country lives on the East Coast and they're not concerns though. So here's a great quote. I love quoting Kieran. Financial institutions can leverage open banking as an opportunity to accelerate their existing digital and process simplification strategies. What does it mean? Let open banking help you do what you want to do already. Start with your internal processes. What are those areas in your organisation that you wish you could remove friction, wish you could remove pain points? Is there a synergy there with a potential use case? Let it help with your existing digital transformation and simplification strategies. It doesn't need to be another add-on. It can actually tie in with what you're already hoping to do. But why would a consumer use it? There's a number of reasons. I want my data rights to simplify my complex life. How crazy are our lives? They're just getting crazier in a COVID world. Everything we do is on a phone. If you ever lost your phone, hands up who can remember their phone number of their spouse? Their children? Their work colleagues? And hands are going, hopefully everybody remembers the phone number of their spouse. I did know somebody that didn't, and if they had an ice in their phone with their, their partner's name, long story. I am willing to share my data so you can understand me. I'll share my data with you so that you can understand who I am, not just a fragment of a bank record or a copy of my passport. I will share my data in the provision of proof ofs, automated, informed decisioning to receive personalised services. This is what consumers are saying. If you can make my life easier, quicker, less friction, less painful, I will share my data. They want you to simplify their life. I will use new innovation such as pay to or payment initiation as these will make my life easier. We have seen it in other countries. We, we heard all about the Asian march of payments. In fact, in Spain, the biggest conversation was around embedded finance and the movement of money through payments. And the rise of the mega platforms, one person even said traditional banking could be dead by 2030. 
Now, I stopped breathing at that point, but it, it was a prediction. If you didn't need traditional banks and you could do everything through embedded finance on a platform, that revolutionises the need for, for traditional banks. But I want my digital identity so you can know it's me. I don't want to keep filling out forms. I think that is a sentiment that personally we can all connect with in this room and professionally we know is true. And to share my data, I'm willing to grant access. That is purpose specific, time bound. Maybe it's a one-off consent of data for you to just approve a mortgage. So if I feel I can control how long I'm giving consent, that's, that's the difference. It's revocable. If I lose trust in you, I no longer want to use you at any time, I can, I can pull that consent back and you'll stop. You'll stop processing my data or providing whatever that service is. It's regulated. I want to feel like if I'm giving you my data, you're playing by the rules. These are the areas that we, we really want to do. It's informed, it's purpose specific, it's time bound, it's revocable and it's regulated. This is from a consumer's perspective. But now let me get into some of those use cases. This is Pete. I don't know if his name's Pete, but I, I just like to put a picture up and say this is Pete. Pete's married to Sue. May or may not be true, we'll just imagine. So Pete works in a cafe, Sue's a school teacher. And they find their dream home. They've been looking for a while. And Sue says, I'm too busy. I can't take a day off school. You go down and see the bank. So Pete takes time out of his, his busy schedule and he goes down to the bank, walks into the branch, greeted by the greeter at the front and says, I'd like to inquire about a home loan. Now, you all know how this story goes. Well, we have a home lending manager, but they're very busy and their diary's booked up for days. I'm going to need you to come back on another business day, mind you, to speak to them. Pete sighs and goes, oh, OK. And then to make matters worse, as he turns to walk out the door, she goes, oh, hold on a second. I'm going to need you to bring some documents back with you to show the home lending manager. And the shopping list is produced, and it rolls, and it hits the floor. It's that long. So we need proof of income, we need balances of superannuation, we need to know if you have any finance, like a car loan, who it's with, how much it was for, how long you've got it to go, where's the payment schedule. We need to know your credit score, we need to know uh, your balance sheet, and not just for you, but your partner or whoever is applying for the mortgage, and the list just goes on. So Pete goes away and he gets all the information, he takes another day off work or a couple of hours, he comes back, he hands it to the home lending manager. The home lending manager says, thank you very much, but you actually missed up. I need copies of your credit card statements and the list goes on. Anyway, we know how this goes. I went through this 12 months ago and I'm a reformed banker. I knew what I was going to be asked for. I just wanted to see how long it was going to take him to produce a shopping list because it's like sport. But what if none of this had to actually occur? What if the bank had employed open banking? What if Pete could actually inquire about that home loan on the mobile banking side or on the app? What if open banking confirmed the transaction records, garnered that his credit score was, was OK, used a personal finance management app to confirm superannuation balances or anything else, actually looked for categorisation and analytics of the spending they already knew he, he was, um, his, his income was confirmed. Like, there are so many things that open banking can do. Now, imagine if that was supercharged and it could actually be done in minutes or seconds. We talk about the sub nine second or the sub second mortgage somebody came out with the other day. I don't want to get your hopes up. I don't think it's going to become a sub second, you know, real time, I apply, bang, you're approved. But what if this was all possible? What would that mean for Pete and Sue? What would that mean for your home lending managers? What would that mean for risk mitigation, reducing friction, reducing costs? These are the real world applications of, of open banking that are very much possible and they will become more possible as time goes on. 
But now we start to think outside banking. This is where banking merges with your life. Hands up if you have children. I'm assuming that most of them would be school age or out the other side. My kids have grown up. They're adults now. I am so glad I don't have to deal with schools anymore. But if you remember when you were enrolling your child, especially if they went to a private school, you would go to the school, you'd apply. They'd want proof of income. They'd want you to confirm credit cards. They'd want you to do everything. They'd assess your education records. Were you the type of people that they wanted in that school? The list goes on. Imagine if you had an app to the school. I'd like to inquire about sending my darling little red-headed child, neither am I more red-headed, um, to school. I give consent for you to access their education records. I give you consent to confirm that I can afford your school. I give consent that I'm legally allowed to enrol this child in school. Off the application goes. A message comes back by SMS from the school sometime later saying, we can offer your child a place. Please consent for your credit card to be debited, your bank account for the fees, credit card for any of these other little camps or schools or extracurricular, and give consent that you approve for your child to be enrolled. And when you do all that, we will gladly welcome them on the 23rd of January next year. It could be that simple, or even more exciting. Before I spoke on day two in Marbella, they had the McLaren race team in talking about how important removing friction from process was. Now, when I presented this in, in Marbella, I had a retired couple driving down a winding road in an MG, you know, a convertible. And then I thought, no, I want a McLaren sitting in a garage. So think about this. You're ready to buy your next McLaren. Anybody in the room got a McLaren? No? Anybody want a McLaren? Yeah, thank you. So you're ready to buy your next McLaren. You go on to a, a car buying app. I'm not going to say it's that one. And you inquire about a car. Somebody comes back and makes you an offer. Do you like that offer? I consent for money to be paid. I consent for you to check that I have the right license class from main roads to drive it. And I consent for you to send me the best insurance policy that you can get. We're starting to see the merger of your life with your banking, with your payments, with, with public data sets such as transport or education, all morphing into these use cases. And this is where it starts to get very, very exciting. So how do you get involved with open banking? Now, I'm tipping most people that are bankers in this room have just or are about to go through counselling to get over the compliance stage. Anybody? Slightly scarred? I still remember when open banking existed in two areas of the bank. One was on the top floor where the chief risk officer lived and their remit was make sure we don't get in trouble with the regulators. And the other was in the basement where all good developers were kept, no offence to the developers in the room, who were told, make it happen. And nobody else in the entire organisation cared at all. But that's changing. So what can you do? You've got to get your house in order. You've got to be realistic about what type of organisation. Are you leaning into digital? What's your technology? You don't have to have all the answers, but you've got to start looking at it. You need to change your mindset. This isn't a compliance activity. This is an opportunity. You need to deepen your, deepen your customer understanding. You're not building those use cases that you think make sense. You're building what your customers need and what's going to keep them loyal to you going forward. And you need to understand your acceleration points. Maybe you don't build it out yourself. Maybe you partner with an organisation such as a certain one that's very good at providing solutions to the industry, just saying. So what do you do next? You have to develop an open banking slash open data strategy. You've got to at least put it on the board agenda. And you've got to prioritise your use case focuses. This is really simple. You get a group of people that are diverse into a room with a whiteboard and you just dream. 
That's as complex as it needs to be. Dream. Dream about the biggest thing you can think about, then dream about the smaller and, and find a middle ground. And then as you progress, you need to detail your strategy execution. So are you going to build it? Are you going to buy it in? Are you going to partner? There's an infinite amount of possibilities there. And you need to develop a consumer data right roadmap. But everybody look around this room, and there's probably other friendly organizations that you work with on various things that may have already been down that journey and you can lean on. So I love to quote somebody that's going to come up on the stage in a second. And I actually thought this was a disco ball, and somebody pointed out it's a crystal ball. But to be competitive in this new market, you need to be good at identifying partners who can deliver for you now, but more importantly, into the future. Yes, I just ad-libbed over the top of a quote, but that's OK. So I think, James, I'm giving you 37 seconds back into your life. Come on. It was pretty close to the hour. James, you are going to... No, no, we're, we're um, out of time, unfortunately. Um, OK. So, yeah, for the Q&A, but you'll be available at morning tea. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, good, as will, be, as will Bianca for any questions um, around uh, that, that anyone will have for you. Yeah, yes. so please uh, thank Jamie very much. Thank you all. <laughs>